Hi, this is Pastor Nelson Mercado. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast from the Nashville First Seventh-day Adventist Church. I hope you are blessed by today's message. Well, friends, it's, uh, it's been an exciting month since we started discovering Revelation. Amen. Yes, there's a lot of work, but the rewards are even greater. Amen. We've seen God work. We've seen him clear things up. We've seen the lights of people uh, in their minds, you know, you know, turn on. And, you know, the reality is not, not, none of this is possible without the help of everybody that's involved. And so I want to thank all of, those, all, of those, all of those that came here night after night and were here and were supporting and praying. Um, of course, um, just a, a big thanks to our, our church elders that were here um, also night after night leading and asking questions, and we had a good time asking softball questions and asking difficult questions. Um, thankful to uh, those that are, were part of the uh, registration, Amy and, and Adwa, um, audiovisual, Talea and Vic and, and Brent and Lawrence, uh, our greeters, and Demeke, thank you for setting that up. For our children's program, Lucy and, and Ariana, uh, Stacy, uh, Charlotte, uh, Zilla worked and helped out with that. Um, I may have forgotten others, but um, Jun Lan, Jun Lan was absolutely there. Um, the musicians, um, you know, the kitchen people, and John Luke was. So that's right, John Luke was there too. He was he was a jack of all trades because he served as greeter and, and all kinds of other stuff. So. So thankful for everybody, Lord, uh, you know, because none of this is possible without help. You know, you can't do this by yourself, so thank you very much. And uh, God will continue working, amen? amen? God will continue working. Tonight, uh, uh, this morning, our presentation is the testimony of Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there's a last day prophecy in the book of Joel that says that we ought to expect in the last days dreams and visions. And so we're going to yes. dig into that a little more. Uh, I think this is one of the most interesting subjects in Bible prophecy, uh, but I, probably one of the most misunderstood ones. As we come into the, in, in a move into the 21st century, I know that there are many who are abusing this gift and this testimony of Jesus and uh, maybe using it in a way that God never intended. And so, as usual, we're going to open the Word of God and, and God is going to clear things up. Amen? Amen? Pray with me now. Loving Father, again, we are thankful for this opportunity to open your word. Lord, we thank you for this uh, month series of discovering revelation where you have presented to us things that what some of us knew and were reminded and some of us learned some new things. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you've, prepared, you've, you've given us a message of preparation for the soon return of Jesus. And our now as we, we uh, open our, our, our Bibles and, and study your word in this last presentation of the series, yet again, we pray for your spirit to give us understanding and that, that what we're learning will impact our lives. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, last night we studied the remnant movement of the last days, God's last day united church. And we discovered that the remnant church has a number of identifying characteristics. First of all, it has to be worldwide, right? Because it preaches a message to all the world, right? To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, to every kindred and tongue. And then secondly, it must be preaching that the hour of judgment has come. Not that the judgment is coming, but there's, there's a judgment that has already started. And this is something we studied during our uh, Discovering Revelation presentations. Thirdly, they have to uh, call people to return to an instinctive worship of God as creator. We worship God because he is the creator of heaven and earth. And of course, the, the language of Revelation 14, as we know, is the language of the fourth commandment. And so the Sabbath is part of this. God's end time people keep the Sabbath because it's a memorial of creation. It is a sign of loyalty to our God. Fourthly, they have to be telling the world that Babylon is fallen and they are calling people to come out of Babylon. And finally, they, uh, well, not finally, there's a few more. Uh, uh, beware of the beast. We're talking about the mark of the beast, not to uh, receive the mark of the beast. Uh, they keep the commandments of God, and that's not just ten, uh, two of them or five of them or nine of them. It's all ten of them, right? And, uh, and then, of course, they have the testimony of Jesus. And so the Bible's description of the end-time remnant church is very specific. 
And we discovered last night that there's only one movement in world history that fits the exact description of Bible prophecy. Well, this morning, I want to return to Revelation 12, 17 and dig a little deeper in the characteristics presented here. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and made, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And you know, one of the things that I, I presented last night, a reminder, is that God has always had a remnant people. That at every critical junction in history, God has had a remnant. You remember in the times of the flood, he had Noah in his family. As Babylon it starts to grow and become an influence, God called Abraham and his family out of Babylon. And out of Abraham, God created a nation, a nation that would proclaim the gospel, prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. That was the children of Israel. But you know that Satan... Remember the promise that God had made to Adam and Eve there in Genesis 3.15, the, the, out of the seed of the woman will come someone who will crush your head. And Satan wasn't happy about it. He would do everything that he could to make sure that the seed of the woman would not be successful. And so he put his foot in the door and he caused the children of Israel to commit idolatry. And yet, when we come to 1 Kings, where we, where we read about Ahab, King Ahab that marries Queen Jezebel and, and, and really leads in, uh, the, the children of Israel into, into idolatry, even then, God calls a prophet, Elijah, and there were 7,000 people who had not bowed their, their knees to Baal. There's always a remnant. In the New Testament, after the temple had been destroyed, uh, God raised up, of course, the New Testament church. So the pattern is the same. In the last days, we'll see the same thing. As the horror begins to move out of the dark ages, God raised up one more remnant church, one last group of believers from every walk of life. And now we know that this remnant is the one that keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. So what is the testimony of Jesus? This is a very specific expression, and we find it in several parts in the Bible. Let me show you something interesting. Revelation 19.10. Now, here in Revelation 19, an angel appears to John. And John becomes so overwhelmed by the presence of this angel that he does something he shouldn't do. He, he bows and, and, and worships this angel. And, of course, the angel corrects him because we ought to worship only God. But notice what happens here. Uh, Revelation 19, 10, and I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and I and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So if we ask what the question is, what is the testimony of Jesus? What is it? The it's the spirit of prophecy. But what exactly does that mean? Well, fortunately, we don't have to go too far because a few chapters later in Revelation 22, the same thing happens again. An angel appears to John, and John is overwhelmed again, and he, and he bows to worship the angel. But I want, to note, I want you to notice the difference here. Revelation 22, then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. So Revelation 19 and Revelation 22 are parallel passages, parallel uh, uh, structures here, but there's a little bit of a difference. A moment ago, the angel said, I am your fellow servant, and I am of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Now he says, I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, what? The prophets. That is the only difference there. In one verse, he says, the, the brethren have the testimony of Jesus, and in the next, the brethren are the prophets. Why is this? Well, because it is the prophets who have the testimony of Jesus. When the Bible talks about the testimony of Jesus, it's talking about a particular spiritual gift. In fact, let me show you what Paul says about this gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul here confirms the believers in Corinth that they have a special gift, and that special gift is the testimony of Christ. So he's talking about a spiritual gift. 
something that God gives the church to help the church get ready to finish the work and prepare in the world for the second coming of Jesus. A spiritual gift, friends, is something that all believers have. Let me say that again. A a spiritual gift is something that every believer has. It's something that God gives you to help you participate in the work of the church. There are several passages in Scripture that highlight some of what these uh, gifts are. Notice Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. But to each of one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. When Jesus went back to heaven, the Bible says that he gave us spiritual gifts, these special abilities to help us do the work of God. It's the resource that God gives us to finish the assignment. And the Bible says that every single believer has been given one of those gifts. Notice, and he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So why did God give these spiritual gifts according to this passage? For the equipping of, for ministry. See, the gifts are not there to entertain ourselves. God does not give us these gifts so that we can feel good about ourselves and show, look how talented and blessed I am. No, no, no. The gifts is given because God has asked us to do something and he is equipping us for it. You and I are not supposed to be spectators. We have a work to do. You're supposed to participate in the life of the church together with everybody else. You're supposed to add your gifts to the gifts of everybody else in the body of Christ. There are no exceptions with this, friends. Every believer has gifts. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, pastor, I don't know what my gifts are. Well, if you don't know what your gifts are and you're interested, you know, talk to me afterwards and we'll give you some resources so you can discover your gifts. Yeah. But everybody has a gift. Yeah. But I want you to notice here in this list that there is a gift that is mentioned. And that's the gift of prophets. Some will be prophets. And this gift is actually mentioned in every single gift, uh, list of spiritual gifts that we find in the New Testament. Let me show you 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 11. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now there's a a couple of things that I want to point out in this passage. And the first thing is that it says that the Holy Spirit gives gifts, gifts to each one. Which means, again, that everybody has a gift. There is no exceptions with that. Everyone has something valuable to contribute to the work of the church. Secondly, it says that the Spirit actually gets to decide what gifts you give. And this is important because there are some well-meaning Christians who say that anybody that really believes in Jesus will have a particular gift. That there's this gift, you know, only high-level Christians will get this particular gift. And everybody that is in that level gets the same gift, but not according to the Bible. The Bible says that God, the Holy Spirit, gets to decide what gifts you get. And thirdly, I want you to notice again that the gift of prophecy is uh, listed in that passage. And the same thing happens in Romans chapter 12. Now here, I I will be honest with you when I I get a bit uncomfortable because every so often, this has happened a number of times since I've been a pastor, somebody will come to me and say, Pastor, I have the gift of prophecy. I have the spiritual gift of prophecy, and I have a message from the Lord for you. And then they go on a tangent, and they go into the twilight zone into something really weird. So, but, but, but it makes me uncomfortable to think that some people may have the gift of prophecy, and yet I have to accept it because the Bible says that we need to expect this in the last days. It's in every single list of spiritual gifts. And on top of that, the Bible very specifically says that you and I are going to see this spiritual gift in the last days. 
Joel 2.28, notice, it shall come to pass uh, afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Joel mentions that we should expect this prophetic gift in conjunction with the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. In other words, in the last day, God says the prophetic gift will be found among God's people. And so really, I have no choice. I have to accept that it is possible for somebody to have this gift, this gift because the Bible says it's going to happen. Now, if somebody, you know, tells you, oh, well, you know, I have the gift of prophecy, you don't want to just take their word for it, right? Because Jesus made it clear that there's going to be false prophets, right? Matthew 24, verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. Now, there's something interesting in this passage. Jesus says that the false prophets show great signs and wonders. And that means that even a miracle is no guarantee that something is coming from God. Someone might, you know, come along and and do things that defy explanation, but you still have to check that out with the Bible. That doesn't prove anything because according to Jesus, even false prophets are going to be able to, to do some really amazing things. So again, a miracle, not proof that something is true, not according to the Bible. You still have to check what you see and what you hear against what the Word of God says. Amen? All right. So how how should we handle this then? We have to accept that it's possible for, for people to have the gift of prophecy because the Bible says so, but at the same time, we need to be careful because in the last days, there's going to be false prophets. So how do we tell the difference? With all the religious confusion in in the world today, I want to be absolutely sure that I'm not falling for deception. The book of Revelation tells us that the spirits of demons are going all over the world performing miracles, faking spiritual gifts, deceiving the nations. So I want to be absolutely sure that I know the truth. So how can we tell the difference? Well, the Bible makes it absolutely easy for us. The first thing that the Bible tells us is to test all things. What are, what are we supposed to do? Yes. Test all things. Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. It says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Amen. So you and I are not just to, be, to reject prophesying, you know, just because somebody says they're a prophet. You don't automatically reject it. You're supposed to test all things. And you keep what is good. Pay attention to it. If, and if it passes a test, you know it's true. So how do we test it? If it was to test all things, well, what do we do to test it? Well, the Bible gives us some really good guidelines. And first of all, if God were actually to reveal the future to someone, God is not going to make a mistake, right? And so if a person with a genuine gift of prophecy is going to uh, uh, predict something, they're going to get things right. Because if God is the source of the message, it has to be true because God cannot lie and God does not make mistakes, right? Make sense? So think about it. If I were to tell you in no uncertain terms that tonight a terrorist is going to fly a plane against your house at exactly 8.05 p.m. and 8.05 passes and now it's 8.30 and, and nothing has happened, what do you say about my spiritual gift? Well, I don't have one because if God had given me this, then God was not going to make a mistake. It can't be the real thing because God, you know, doesn't get things wrong. And here's a Bible passage to back it up. Deuteronomy 18.22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. God simply does not make mistakes. A real prophet has to get things right every single time. With one exception, there is such a thing as a conditional prophecy. A conditional prophecy. This is a prophecy that will come to pass if certain conditions are met. For example, Jonah, God, the prophet Jonah was told to preach to Nineveh, to tell the people of Nineveh that if they did not repent, the city was going to be destroyed. Now, if you read the story, you know, at least in the book of Jonah, they did repent at that time, and God did not destroy the city. So that's a conditional prophecy. But other than that, if someone says that the Lord told them that something would happen, and it doesn't happen, it's simply not the real thing. So let's take this test 
and apply it to some of the maybe well-known, and I put this in quotations, prophets that we hear about today. Some of you have heard of this guy here. Who is this guy? Nostradamus, right? The French prognosticator of the 1500s. Fascinating character. And a lot of people uh, believe that he had the gift of prophecy. So much so that you can still find his books today. And people read them. Yeah. Every, every, every start of the new year, you go into the checkout aisle and you find one of those magazines. Oh, well, 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 well Nostradamus predicts for this year. Yeah. So let's check this out. During his lifetime, this, this is um, a, a, an acquaintance of mine did this study and he found some many interesting things. That during his lifetime, this a French prophet wrote about uh, some 449 prophecies, major prophecies. And of those, only 18 have been proven wrong. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's pretty amazing. But now, is 18 wrong the same as 100% right? No, right? Would God get 18 wrong? Of course he wouldn't. But that's, that's still pretty amazing, though. Yeah. Until you consider that, that um, from those prophecies, 390 of them don't really fit into anything that has ever happened in the history of the world. So at the end of the day, he's only accurate 9% of the time. Now, would you trust uh, your heart surgeon if he only was accurate 9% of the time? No, of course not. So why would you, why would you, uh, you know, risk your, your trust your eternal future in a man who uses forbidden methods uh, uh, and, and he's only accurate 9% of the time anyway? So 9% of the time. But, you know, there are others who are, have a better accuracy rate. Yeah. Yeah, uh, here, uh, Jean Dixon, he, she was uh, an, famous in the last century. Notice, she was accurate 30 to 60% of the time. But even if she was high, as, as high as 60% of the time, would God be wrong 40% of the time? No. And the same thing is with others like Edward K, Edgar Case. He was called a sleeping prophet. And just about anybody else that, you know, you know, they call themselves prophet. And, you know, a lot of times it has to do with the way they say things. For example, if I were to tell you today, I'm a prophet. Listen to me, I am a prophet, I have the gift. And I'm going to make a prediction. Within the next five years, there's going to be some kind of major natural disaster in the world. Yeah. Then a year from now, there's a big earthquake somewhere in, in Asia or something, and many people die. And I say, here it is. See, I, I, I said it was going to happen. Does that make me a prophet? Of course not. It's just the way they say things. They word certain things. Oh, yeah, he, he was accurate all that time, but it's just, you know, common sense things. It doesn't prove anything. So test number one, if they make predictions, they have to be true unless, of course, that there are conditional prophecies. Test number two, if someone has the genuine gift of prophecy, they have to be faithful to the Word of God. This is just common sense, friends. They have to agree with the Bible. They're not going to contradict Scripture because God doesn't change his mind about what's written in the Bible. But, but, but be careful now. Some of you are clapping. Because if, if, if a person that claims to be a prophet is contradicting Scripture, how are you going to know it? You've got to know the Bible yourself, right? Otherwise, they can tell you anything, and, well, you know, the prophet said it, but if you're not familiar with Scripture, and that's part of the problem. We've seen this all through our, our series when we talk about the signs of the second coming and all those things. Well, why do people follow these personalities when the Bible says there's false Christ? Why? Because they don't read their Bibles. You've got to be familiar with Scripture, friends. So if God gives a gift to, uh, you know, this person has a special message for our day, uh, and he says that it comes from God, it, it has to agree with what the Bible says. Here's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. If a so-called prophet disagrees with the Bible, then you know the gift is, doesn't come from God. Even, even if, if this prophet does, does amazing things, even if it managed to, to, to predict, all the predictions come 100% accurate, if they disagree with the Bible, you throw it out. You throw it out. Here's another text, Isaiah 8.20. 
to the law and to the testimony, if they spe- do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If a so-called prophet does not agree with God's word, then you go the other way. If they don't agree with God's law, this is another one, friends. If, you ha- if this so-called prophet is telling you, well, you know, the Christians this today doesn't ha- don't have to obey the commandments of God. That was for the Jews only. If that's what they say, you go the other way. Because this agrees with the word of God. The Bible seems to indicate, though, that the genuine gift of prophecy won't even be found among people who disregard the law. For example, we hear here in Lamentations chapter 2. Now, Lamentation was, brought, was written by the prophet Jeremiah, and he writes it as a, a, you know, he's mourning because of the destruction that the Babylonians have, have, have you know, done on Jerusalem and the temple. And we know that the reason, we saw this last night, that the reason why Jerusalem was destroyed is because they turned their backs on God, did not keep the law of God, and even broke the Sabbath. And so notice here the words of Jeremiah, the law is no more and her prophets have no vision from the Lord. And there's examples in the Bible of, of this. You, you can think of the prof, uh, uh, King Saul, uh, the first king of, of Israel. When he started his reign, he was really a man of God. He, he actually, uh, uh, the Bible says he was prophesying. But then he turns his back on God, does his own thing, and the, the communication stopped. The prophet Samuel dies and God... There was no more communication from God. And he got desperate. The Bible says that he went into the witch of Endor. He wanted the, the spiritists to tell him what God was doing. And, of course, that ended, ended costing him his life. Yeah. So a genuine prophet has to get things right when they make a prediction, right? Unless there's a conditional prophecy. And then they have to agree with the Bible. They have to agree that it's not going to contradict Scripture. And then the Bible says that if uh, uh, God is really communicating to someone, he, he does this not through Ouija boards or, uh, you know, crystal balls or, or the palm readers. No, no, it is through dreams and visions. He's going to communicate through dreams and visions. You know, the Bible makes this very clear in Numbers 12, 6. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Joel 2.28, 2, uh, 2, you your old men shall uh, dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And of course, um, you know, most people today that claim to be prophets, you know, you, you, this, this sort of rules them out. It rules out the psychics and the channelers, those who you know, read the crystal balls and all those things, those who claim to be able to talk to the dead through these seances in the middle of the night. Because if their message comes from God, it's going to come through dreams and visions. Because God speaks directly to the mind. And that makes perfect sense. Because in some ways, it offers the perfect encryption. You know, the Bible infers that the devil doesn't know, can't read our thoughts. And of course, he is a created being. Only God can read our thoughts. And so, if God speaks to your mind through dreams and visions, the devil can't intercept and change the meaning. And that brings me to the next point. If someone has a dream or a vision from God, sometimes they actually stop breathing while they are in vision. Yeah. Now, this is not a test as much as it is a manifestation of what happens when the prophet is in vision. Notice what happened to Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, verse 17. As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. So someone that goes in vision, you should expect they're breathing to stop because this is something supernatural that is happening. And, and if you think about the reason why for this, is because the genuine gift of prophecy is very hard to fake. And so someone claims to have the gift of prophecy, and maybe you're there when they have a vision, pinch their nose and see how long the vision lasts. It's a way of, of determining it. It's impossible to counterfeit. And then at least sometimes people exhibit supernatural strength while in vision. And here is again an example from Daniel, verse eight, chapter 10, verse 18. Then again, the one having the likeness of the man touched me and strengthened me. Daniel collapses on the floor. He's exceedingly weak, but somehow the, the angel touches him and he supernaturally is strengthened. So there you have it. There's five guidelines, thing, things to watch for. A real prophet is going to be right 100% of the time. A real prophet is going to agree with Scripture. A real prophet is going to hear from God through dreams and visions. A real prophet will stop breathing when they're in, in vision. And sometimes accompanied by 
supernatural strength. And again, if you look carefully at these guidelines, you'll notice that the real gift of prophecy is hard to fake. And so the big question is then, does it still happen today? Well, we, we, we have to expect it, right? Because we saw it from Scripture that's something that we ought to watch for in the last day. So it must still happen. And by the way, I'm convinced that it does. Now, this morning, I would like to share with you a case study of someone who I believe had this gift, the gift of prophecy. But now, some of you that, that have been here since the beginning of the, the uh, seminar know one of the things I told you on the first night, and I repeated it a number of times. Don't take my word for it. Do not take my word for anything. Don't say, well, Pastor Nelson said this, so it must be true. No, you check it out. Amen. This is something we, I said several times during the seminar. So, you know, I'm going to share this, this, this uh, case study with you, but you are not to believe that this person had the gift of prophecy because Pastor Nelson said it. If you come to that conclusion, it should be because you looked it up. You investigate it. And by the way, that is the duty and responsibility of every Christian. Since God says, the Bible says clearly that we can expect this gift in the end of time, in the last days, and since Jesus said also there's going to be false prophets, it is your duty to check this out. Remember, you don't just throw away anybody that, that claims to have this gift. We ought to test all things. You have to test it. It is your duty and responsibility to do so. But I'm going to share with you this case study. And then you make the determination. So her name was Ellen Harmon. She was born in 1827. Later on, she married a man by the name of James White, and so she became Ellen White, and that's how she's usually known. She was a remarkable woman. In fact, and you can check this out too, the Smithsonian recently named her as one of the 100 most influential Americans of all time. Now, as a little girl at the age of nine, she, she accepted Jesus there in, in the Methodist church, a few years later, by the age of 17, people say, say that something remarkable happened at a prayer meeting. They say that she had a vision in front of a group of believers that was there. And in this vision, people were making their way to heaven through a, a straight and narrow path. They, they, they were leaving the world and following Jesus to the promised land. Now, at first glance, it seems perfectly biblical, but the Bible does say we have to test all things to be sure, right? Now, over the course of her lifetime, she had some 2,000 such experiences. But again, the question is, was this the real gift? So let's put this to the test. Now, obviously, if she had 2,000 such experiences, we don't have the time to go over all of them. But we're going to get to touch on a few, and, and, and so you make up your mind. First of all, if her gift was a real thing, she had to, if she was making a prediction, she had to be accurate because God does not make mistakes. So did Ellen White make predictions that came true? Well, it appears so. Let me give you an example. Back in 1902, she warned the people in San Francisco and Oakland that these cities were becoming very, very wicked cities and that God was, had shown her that he was going to deal with them if they didn't change their ways. And then on another case, she had a vision related to this. She saw a building shaking, like she says, like reeds in the wind and, and fire burning all over the city. Now, nobody believed anything she said until it actually happened. In 1906 was the big earthquake. You can read about it in the news or look at it in, in, online to, to see what, the, uh, what the, the news said back in those days. But it wiped out San Francisco. To this day, it still ranked as one of the most devastating earthquakes of all time. Some 3,000 people died that day, 80% of the city was destroyed, and the fires that started because of the earthquake had burned for days on end. Then further back in 1864, Ellen White said something that people, most people laughed at at the time. She said that the Lord has shown her that tobacco is a poison of most deceitful and malignant kind. And she said that people were going to discover that smoking was dangerous because God has said, you know, that God's people should stay away from this. This is a killer. Now, you, you may wonder, well, well, that doesn't make sense. I mean, what, what's the big deal? She made that, 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 that prophecy. Uh, and everybody knows that, you know, cigarettes is bad, but not in those days. See, back in her time, doctors were prescribing cigarettes for lung ailments. You can look it up. 
This was medicine back in those days. And so here's Ellen White talking against what the medical uh, uh, science used to say. Yeah. And of course, no, you know, everybody laughing at her, but not, you know, not today not, nobody's laughing. Because obviously we know that you know, cigarettes are killing us, right? But here's the amazing thing. She knew it before everybody else. In fact, it wasn't until 1957, almost 100 years later, that the American Heart Association concluded that smoking causes lung cancer. Medical science didn't catch up to her for almost 100 years. So how in the world did she know this 90 plus years in advance? And how did she know this one? In 1906, she said that the x-ray is not the great blessing that some suppose it to be. If used unwisely, it will do much harm. Now, why would she say that? Well, because in 1906, the x-ray was a sideshow novelty. People were going, it would go to the, uh, the carnival for entertainment, they pay a few cents, and they will get the x-ray taken. That's the way this was done back in those days. And she said, no, it's dangerous. And of course, Nobody thought about it a big deal, but now we know that, of course, this is harmful, right? You have, you, if you get an x-ray, they put this little lead apron on you on the sensitive areas, and the x-ray technician runs out, right, to take the picture. Why? Because it's bad. It's bad. And how did she know this one? In 1893, she started to describe, uh, talk about the electrical force of the brain. And of course, people laughed at her because nobody knew how the uh, brain operated, and certainly the electrical force, they thought that was crazy stuff. But today, nobody's laughing because it's exactly what people have found today. She was right, with only a third grade education. So did she pass the test? Well, it would seem so. In fact, at one point, she stood up in a church in Michigan and predicted the start of the American Civil War, and she said that many people in that church where she was talking was going to die as a result of that war. And people laughed at her, but when it happened, nobody laughed. Yeah. So how did she know this stuff? How did she know that stuff? Somehow, with a third grade education, Ellen White has become the most translated female author in the history of the world, second only to Agatha Christie. And, and in the United States, she is the most translated American author in the history of American literature. Look it up. You can check it out. You can Google this. This is all information that's available to you. One of her books was about the principles of Bible, biblical principles on education. And on one occasion, the minister of education from Norway was in America, and he happened to read her book, and long story short, even to this day, the Norwegian school system is based on the writings of Ellen White on education. This with a third grade education. But now we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's look at the next test. So again, test number one, they've got to predict accurately, and this appears to be true in the case of Ellen White. Test number two, they've got to agree with the Bible. If someone puts themselves above the Bible or dismisses the teachings of the Bible, you can dismiss them because the Christian accepts only the Bible as their final rule of faith. Amen? Yeah. That is our manual. So no matter how gifted a person may appear to be, if they dismiss the Bible, if they substitute something else for the Bible, or maybe they put their writings on par with the Bible, you pass on that. You pass on that. Actually, you know, I have never seen anybody like Ellen White who actually worked so hard to get people back to the Bible. Yeah. Notice what she said. Cling to your Bible as it reads and stop your criticisms in regard to its validity and obey the word and not one of you will be lost. You know, it's, it's amazing how applicable that is for today. Yeah, but, but actually she wrote this at a time when Christians started to critique the Bible and many of them were buying into the theory of evolution. She wrote this during a time when a so-called prophet Joseph Smith had insisted that the Bible was corrupted and now that he had a book to replace it. During her entire lifetime, Ellen White pleaded with people to go back to the Bible, quit questioning it, quit criticizing it, just start reading it and living by it. She was a huge fan of the Protestant principle Notice there is, no, there is a need of a return to the great Protestant principle, the Bible and the Bible only as the rule of faith and duty. Amen. Does this sound like somebody who was pushing the Bible to the side? No, she agreed with it. She agreed with it. In fact, when people started to believe that she might have this gift of prophecy, some of them got too excited and went the extra mile, if, if you will, and she, they wanted to, to put her writings on par with the Bible, and she had to rebuke them. 
She had to rebuke them. She said, no, no, no. Notice, this reveals the right attitude. She says, but don't you quote Sister White. Quote the Bible. Talk the Bible. It is full of meat, full of, of fatness. Carry it out in your life. Now, let me, let me stop there real quick and, and sort of clarify something. Because there is a misconception out there that Seventh-day Adventists base their beliefs on the writings of Ellen White. In fact, you can look this up on the internet. There's plenty of things that, uh, sources that say that. Let me assure you, that's fake news. That is fake news. In fact, you know, I, I am obviously a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Those of you who have been coming to the Discovering Revelation seminar, what book have we been studying since day one? We've been studying the Bible. The Bible and the Bible only, friends. And that's because Seventh-day Adventists are people of the Bible. Based on our beliefs on what Scripture says. On what Scripture says. Now, we do talk about this gift of prophecy. Why? Because the Bible talks about it. Because this is a gift that God says will happen in the end. But let me show you the official statement from the Seventh-day Adventist Church on this issue. The writings of Ellen White, notice, are not a substitute for Scripture. They cannot be placed on the same level. The Holy Scriptures stand alone, the unique standard by which her and all other writings must be judged and to which they must be subject. The Bible is the supreme standard. Seventh-day Adventists fully support the Reformation principle of sola scriptura. The Bible is its own interpreter and the Bible alone as the basis of all doctrines. That's pretty clear, isn't it? All right, let's move on. Now, we'll handle the last three all together because, again, they're simply manifestations the way that, the, the, that you should expect the gift to present itself. And so a real prophet of God has dreams and visions. A real prophet will stop breathing while in vision and sometimes accompanied by supernatural strength. Now, this is all true with Ellen White. She, uh, she uh, didn't use crystal balls, obviously. She didn't use you know, cards or, or palm readers, none of that. She got her, uh, her information, if you will, from dreams and visions. Yeah. Now, sometimes something's very interesting things would happen while she is in vision. She was in vision. Um, notice that, that, that image there. At one point, she, she, she held an 18-pound Bible above her head, sort of like you see here. Uh, I think it was probably a little higher and basically what she was doing is that she's in vision with the Bible like this, and she would point with her finger, and where she pointed, she started to read that passage. And then she would turn the page and then point at another one. She's not looking at the Bible because she's in vision, and she would point at it and read them. And, and of course, there was curious people that were there. One of them stood on a stool just to look what she was doing, and absolutely, every time she pointed to a verse, she was absolutely right. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you've ever... Uh, uh, held 18 pounds over your head for an extended period of time. But let me tell you, that's physically impossible. In fact, there was a, a, um, a Mr. Universe uh, man who had heard about what she had done, and he actually used the same Bible that, that, that she used. Uh, they, they keep it in a museum. And he tried to, uh, to do it. He was only able to do it for eight, for eight minutes. He's Mr. Universe. So notice, this is just a, a, a sample of the fact that supernatural strength can be added while a person is in vision. On another occasion, Ellen White went to a vision. People held candles and mirrors under her nostrils because to see if she was breathing. Yeah. Um, there was one guy that uh, we're told that was a skeptic on the gift of Ellen White. He was very critical of her. And so he was there. And so while she's in vision, he went and tested it himself. He put a mirror under her nostrils and he ran out of there saying, oh my God, she, she's not breathing. She's not breathing. So, you know, this appears to be true, friends. This gift seems to match. So it seems to say that she had the real gift. And that's exciting, again, because the Bible says that in the last days, you and I should expect this to happen among God's people. By the way, you know, if, you, if you've known of Ellen White and if, as a Seventh-day Adventist and, and know that we believe that she had that gift, understand that she is not the only one who will have that gift. Again, we saw in Joel that, you know, your, daughter, your, your, your sons and your daughters, in plural, shall prophesy. So we can expect this gift to happen more just before Jesus comes. It's not just Ellen White, okay? And so, again, that means that we have to be paying attention. We have to be alert because let me tell you, I'm going to say this honestly because, I, you know, you can expect this. I tell you, I do research on this kind of thing online. There are people, and I put this in quotation, who are 
claim to be under the umbrella of the Seventh-day Adventist Church who claim to have this gift, okay? So you need to pay attention and you need to test all things because true prophets will come and if you dismiss everybody, you're going to miss the real thing. But you've got to be watching, you've got to be paying attention, you have to test to all things. Back to Revelation 12, 17, and the, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The Bible clearly talks about the prophetic gift reemerging in the last days, and so you and I should expect it. It shouldn't surprise us when it happens. And if the real thing happens, you want to know about it. It's something that you don't want to miss. You need to check it out. And, and by the way, one of the best ways in the case of the gift of Ellen White to check out whether this is a true thing or not is to read what she wrote. To read what she wrote. It's just common sense. Now, you ought to ro- read what she wrote with the Bible on hand because you want to make sure that what she says doesn't contradict Scripture. So it's with the Bible in hand. And, and just for, for that sake... We have um, um, outside, and um, matter of fact, um, let, me, let me ask, John Luke, can you remind Quabina, where is, is Quabina here? Yeah, there's some, there's some books out there on the table, you saw them, um, yes, those Steps to Christ books outside, we're going to give them at the end of the presentation, because I have some, some books there, there's, it's one particular book is called Steps to Christ, and this book is you know, written by Ellen White, and so as uh, we end our presentation tonight and you exit the sanctuary, if you don't have this book, we don't have many of them, but if you don't have this book, then you can tell them, you know, I don't have this book, and they'll give you a copy. This, the, the, and the reason for this is so that you can check this out yourself, okay, because that's, that's going to be the best way to figure out if she did have the gift, if you read what she wrote. So most of you probably have that book, so again, leave it for those who don't have a copy of it, because we don't have many, okay? Now, here's one more thing that I want, to, I want you to think about as we think about God, God's last day remnant movement as a whole. And it's something that Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And this is also true. We can probably add this one to the qualifications of a true prophet. Because a true prophet is not going to only not contradict the Bible, but is going to live the lifestyle of a Christian. And so if I tell you that I have the spirit of prophecy, and I am a prophet of God, but every Saturday night you see me at the bar in the corner getting hammered, then you you know that that's a problem, right? Because I'm not living like a Christian, right? My fruits are telling something different. And the same thing is with Christianity in general. The same thing is with God's last day remnant movement, okay? So we know, of course, the, by the fruits you shall know, what can we say about God's last day remnant movement? We mentioned that last night as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, first of all, it has produced the exact message of Revelation 14. You know, you, you should expect them to preach this message. Again, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, then another angel fly, was flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Secondly, friends, this, this movement has produced the, uh, the largest missionary movement around the world, some 80 times more missionaries around the world than any other movement. And that's because they take their job seriously of taking this everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Adventists take this job seriously, friends. Thirdly, it has produced one of the biggest health care systems in the world, including the famous Loma Linda University Hospital, where the first um, baby heart transplants were performed, where they developed proton therapy for can- uh, prostate cancer. Medical science is amazing, and of course, we are happy that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a hallmark on, on, on uh, health institutions around the world. And we do this because, of course, we know that the Bible tells us that Jesus spent more time healing than in preaching the Word. God's interested in your well-being. He wants you to be healthy as well, and so this is part of the message. This is part of what Seventh-day Adventists do around the world. Lastly, uh, you'll notice here that this last day movement is providing humanitarian relief. Notice in about 119 countries through what's called ADRA, 
ADRA stands for Adventist Development and Relief Agency. This is an organization much like the Red Cross. When there's disasters around the world, the church comes in there and provides humanitarian relief and helps and teaches. In fact, they are now, um, this is an article that I just read, ADRA highlights ongoing humanitarian response in Ukraine after a year after the war. It tells us there the Adventist Development and Relief Agency continues to deliver humanitarian aid to support the people of Ukraine a year after the armed conflict displaced millions of civilians in the Eastern Europe nation. Uh, nation. Most importantly, this movement has produced millions of vibrant Christians from every single walk of life. And they're working together to prepare the world to meet Jesus. Millions of, of people are coming to Christ as a result of their work. Thousands each day, 3, 000, about 3,000 or so each day around the world are coming to Christ. Because it's important to bring people to Jesus in the last, uh, this last phase that we're living of earth's history. Last day movement that is getting the world ready to meet Jesus. Okay? So, one last thing as... as um, Lizbeth comes up to sing our closing song. I, again, I told you I want to give you this gift, the Steps to Christ book. You, talk, you look it over and uh, compare it with Scripture. And if, uh, and if it doesn't match Scripture, you throw it away. But let me tell you, I've looked into this, and I can guarantee that if you look at this with an open heart, with prayer, and, and using your Bible, you're going to come to the same conclusion. You're going to see clearly that this woman indeed had that gift. And so one last point that I want to make is... What is the gift that God has given you? And again, I said earlier, if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, see me, and I'll provide you with some resources so that you can discover what your, your gift is. But, but you think about it, maybe you have a passion right now, a passion for God, something that he's placed on your heart. So what would you do if, if, if you could do anything for God and you know it would be successful, what, what, would, it, what would it be? And so I want you to think about this very carefully because the Bible says that everybody has a gift, a talent uh, that God has given you to help in the advancement of his cause so that we can all work together in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus around the world. That includes you. God wants to use you for this cause. Thanks for joining us. If you're ever in the Nashville area, come and visit us at the Nashville First Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're located at 2800 Blair Boulevard in Nashville, Tennessee. You may also visit us at nfsda.org.